Hello all, welcome to part C of the 18th century. This is Neoclassical Men and Women, and it will be quite a show. And you will also be happy to know that I have turned off the camera. Yay! So let's begin. Okay, men's costuming in the second half of the 18th century uh, continued with the dominance of the frock coat, replacing the just decor in most formal and informal formal occasions. They tend to be shorter, pleats in the back, pull the skirts away from the front of the body. So it's open. So you can see here, more open, usually worn on buttons. Some didn't even have buttons. We see more of the waistcoat, more of the lining of the coat, so they have to be more decorated. Here we see a waistcoat on the left of the period, straight cut now, pretty much, no peplum, no flaring out peplum, tend to be stiff. Collars tend to be stiff when either lay flat or stand up. Interesting here, uh, a popular accessory waistcoats was to wear at least two gold watch fobs to show how important you are. You had to have uh, a watch that was set to time in England and one that was set to the time in the continent that shows what an important businessman you are. Here we see in the last half of the century the morning habit. Usually you would go out in the morning and do your business, your transaction, your trade. So you would have a frock coat. A morning frock coat is still buttoned. Top two or three buttons. As you can see, some of them were massive. Under this, a waistcoat with watch fobs. Here we see the man on the left now has two watch fobs. He's got to hold a third. That's how important he is. Then you have hose and breeches, usually at the knee, that are buckled so they don't ride up as you're walking around being very important. This is the English style, which also was worn some on the continent, which is basically striped waistcoat, striped hose, and a coat collar of contrasting color. Here's the redding coat, the outside coat for um, cold weather, <clears throat> very similar to the frock coat now. Some are surplus or double-breasted and had multiple collars, as you can see in both instances here. Two types of hat. Chapeau bras and the jockey's hat, the chapeau bras. Tall, flat bicorn, usually carried under the arm when not worn. Very flat, so very easy to carry. Jockey's hat was a wide round hat, top hat adapted from horse riders. Yes, they would ride this, while, um, wear this while riding horses. You put a um, cockade of some sort, then you can identify the rider. How about some wigs? The cadugan or toupee. At the top, brush straight back into a high roll with some curls on the side. Popularized, of course, by who else? Lord Cadogan. Also, the hedgehog, a full wig brushed straight back, curls on either side of the face. A version of the Ramil is the Q, longer, narrow ponytail, and then a reemergence of the periwig. Remember that from the 17th century, that big, full, powdered wig, now parted into two pigtails. Here's an interesting tidbit uh, <clears throat> I wanted to pass along. This is kind of interesting. The macaroni. This is decidedly English fashion phenomenon. Um, since families now, merchant families, had disposable income and they wanted to show how well-rounded and educated they were, they would send their young gentlemen, well to gentlemen, off to take a grand tour of Europe, which would take up could take up to six months. And when they came back, they had this somewhat skewed sense of French fashion and a fondness a madness almost for macaroni and Italian pasta. Um, they were satirized for their love of overly long or tall wigs. These are satire, but they're not too far off on the truth. So this sort of foppish character, <clears throat> those are called macaronis. So when the revolution started, when Yankee Doodle rode to town, uh, came to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it, ma and called it macaroni, that's the English making fun of the bumpkin Americans who say, look at me, I got a feather in my cap. I'm like them macaronis over there. So, ha ha, no you're not, you're American bumpkin. Uh, I don't appreciate that. I think I'm gonna take this country for my own. Women's costuming. Men's costuming, that was a short little ride. Women's costume, much, much longer. A bewildering variety of women's clothing in the late 1700s, thanks to the fashion magazines. Um, here in the morning, we see a lady starting her day in a state of undress, known as disable, or if you're French, disabli. She's wearing a taffeta petticoat and a hip-length jacket called a caraco. She's got a clasp on her jacket that's covered by a large satin bow called a parfait contentment, 
or if you want to be the French, parfait contentment. But we're just going to say parfait contentment. Then she's got to get ready for the day. This is a merchant class or upper class woman, of course. Hair and makeup applied by a um, hairdresser wearing a peignoir, a jacket to protect her, protect her chemise and petticoat. Oftentimes, she would hold a book in case company arrives. Not that she's going to read it. Let's not take that too far. But if people show up, she's like, oh, hello, I was just reading some Voltaire while I'm getting my hair done. Of course, peignoirs today means another thing is a kind of sheer uh, cotton nightgown. <clears throat> but at the time, that well, was pretty much the same thing, actually. Here we see the robe a l'anglaise, remember, that was tight-fitted, front and back, without the Watteau pleating. Uh, here we see it with a lace fichu added to the décolletage and hung down the back, kind of tucked in to the neckline. Also, panniers are being replaced by hip pads and this kind of bustle called a false rump. Now here we see uh, two robe a l'anglaise with the false rump. It's usually carved, of cork, carved out of cork, so it's light, covered with fabric. And it made this interesting silhouette known as the powder pigeon. You can see the chest when you put a corset on. The chest jumps out to the front, and the behind goes and the torso are pushed back. So making this sort of pigeon-like or powder pigeon-like silhouette. Oh good, we need a new robe. I thought it was time. Yeah, I know you did too. How about the robe a la polonaise? Yes. This is characterized by an overskirt held up in a draped fashion. You can see whoop whoop with ties or drawstrings or points, if you will. Underskirt has a wide flounce, that's this part here, around the hem. <clears throat> Usually, both pieces are made of matched striped taffeta, and a parfait contentment holds the bodice together. <clears throat> Polonaise usually reveal the ankles, as you can see here, these tiny little feet, and then have these short, narrow, elbow-length sleeves, ruffled or fluted white cotton called sabot sleeves. Like the Anglaise, the Polonaise is fitted both front and back. <clears throat> How about a version of the Polonaise called the Caucasian, which had very short sleeves. You can see here the sleeves barely reach the bicep, and you pull the chemise through, which is decorated with engagements. So the robe a la Polonaise and the Caucasian. The Caraco, remember that jacket, becomes a former part of formal wear. Here we see worn over a separate skirt of either matching or contrasting color. The skirt usually had a deep border that you can see here. It's got this flounce that's sewn on that's really long. But you can see these tiny little ankles. The idea is that these tiny particular ankles are peeking out from this big dress that has uh, either a false rump or panniers. And also sabot sleeves and parfait contentment. Marie Antoinette said, I can do better than that. So she introduced a new type of panniers. Narrow, front to back, but wider through the hips. What this allowed is the front of the dress would become sort of a billboard for decoration, as you can see here in this formal evening wear. Panniers became so wide that even with double doors, women sometimes had to enter sideways through them. So you can see just how big. This is not an exaggeration. This is a fashion plate. So you don't see these in most reenactments or movies or plays this wide because just it's crazy. Now, Marie Antoinette, one to also uh, who loved to um, introduce styles, also introduced the pastoral style. She had a little, uh, I think it was the petty Petit Trianon or something is a little chateau on Versailles grounds that she, um, her, she, her and her mates, her mates are women in waiting, would dress up and pretend they were uh, shepherdesses, milkmaids. So of course they had to have appropriate dress. So here it is. They they interpreted this to be Polonaise and Anglaise robes, accessorized with long canes, flower bouquets, an apron, and they could play dress up and pretend they were simple, humble, rural folk. In England, we have an adaptation of the men's reading coat, which is quite striking, uh, both full length and hip length, often had contrasting collars and, and lapels here, as you can see. Um, and they were very popular among uh, English country gentry, gentlewomen, I should say. More gowns, yay, round gowns or false gowns, because 
They were closed. They were round. You pulled them over. They had no underskirt. This is sort of the continuation of the shepherdess costumes. This is one of the most fashionable, the chemise a la reine. It has a bodice and a neckline, similar in cup to the undergarment chemise, yet with a soft, full score, skirt, as you can see here. And the chemise a la reine, a la reine was not corseted. You pull it on the head and sash it at the waist. So a much gentler, softer look. Then you take a fichu, a ribbon sash, insert it into the neckline. The primary article garment was the police, a cloak padded for warmth and lined with fur and made of satin. Uh, this is very common and continues even to this day as this sort of high fashion outer wear. This concludes part C. Part D, we will finish up with the neoclassical period and the 18th century as a whole.